Let's suppose we've got the following price and income information. Let's plot this consumer's budget constraint. Well, with $480, we could buy 60 units of clothing or 160 units of food, or some combination of the two. The slope of this line will be negative 3 eighths or negative 0 0.375. Let's suppose we know that this consumer's optimal bundle has 80 units of food and 30 units of clothing. So I can mark on a general tangency condition and that bundle. Suppose now this consumer's income stays the same, but the price of both goods rises. If the price of food is $6 and clothing is $9, that changes the amount of clothing and food this can consumer can buy and gives us a new budget line. And because the price changed, we know the slope of this budget line will also have changed. It'll be a negative 6 ninths or negative 0.667. The question here is, how much income would this consumer need in the second period to be as well off as they were originally? What we'll do is we'll take that new budget line and we'll bring it out until it's just tangent to our original indifference curve, right? So the slope of it reflects the new prices and we've increased the income hypothetically to get back to our original yellow level of utility. Well, there'll be a tangency spot there and let's suppose we know that that bundle contains 60 units of food and 40 units of clothing. Let's calculate the expenditure on this new bundle. Well, the price of food is 6 and the quantity of food is 60. The price of clothing is 9 and the quantity of clothing is 40. We'd be spending $720 on that bundle. So what we're saying is, if the prices are $6 and $9, this consumer would need $720 to stay as well off as they were under the old prices. So in principle, when we're looking at a CPI, it should measure the percent increase in the expenditures that would be necessary to keep the utility constant. So ideally, it would be the ratio of the new expenditure to the initial expenditure. In our case, the new expenditure is 720, and our original expenditure is 480, giving us 1.5, telling us the cost of living went up by 50%. So in reality, if we were going to calculate this, we'd need to know the initial and new prices of all the goods and services the consumer was buying. We'd also need to know the initial and new consumption bundles. In practice, we basically collect data just on prices and we use a fixed consumption bundle. It's a large endeavor in and of itself just to get the prices. To survey individual consumers and find out how much they used to buy and buy now, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what the uh, BLS can do. So let's suppose the bundle is fixed with 80 units of food and 30 units of clothing. The expenditure at the original prices would be the $3 and the $8 times those quantities, or the $480. The expenditure at the new prices would be the 6 times the 80 plus the 9 times the 30, or 750. So the resulting CPI would be 750 over 480, giving us 1.56, saying the cost of living went up by 56%. So we've got a little discrepancy here, right? We moved that line and we said the consumer would need $720 to reach the same utility. But then if we hold our baskets fixed because of logistical reasons, we'd find out this consumer needed $750. Well, if this consumer really did have $750 to spend, they could be on a higher indifference, not a higher indifference curve, but a higher budget line, and then ultimately a higher indifference curve, right? And the slope of this line is the same as the slope of our original line, but notice with more money, this consumer could buy 125 units of food and 83.3 units of clothing. What this tells us is that the CPI overstates the cost of living due to the substitution bias. And you might have seen this in your principles of macro course, and now we're formalizing showing how we can prove that.